This is for the Ethics Review class at Parker University. In this video, I'm going to start talking about malpractice in the first element of a malpractice claim. But before I get into that, let's talk first about how often chiropractic malpractice occurs. Most chiropractors are much more concerned and much more worried about suing, being sued for malpractice than they need to or should be worried about. The statistics are pretty good for chiropractors. The, at any given time or any given year, there's only two or three chiropractors out of every 100 who are involved in a malpractice claim. So it's a very small number. Part of the reason it's such a small number is because you don't use surgery and you don't use uh, pharmaceuticals. Even if you make a mistake, a mistake by a chiropractor is not likely to have serious consequences. Now it can. Don't take that as, as an excuse to be careless. Uh, take good care of your patients and be careful in caring for your patients. But don't be too worried or so worried about malpractice that you're unable to take good care of your patients. The other strong indication to me that malpractice claims are extremely rare is to look at your malpractice premiums. The insurance companies do not sell those policies for the purpose of losing money. They expect to generate a profit or at least cover their expenses. And if the premiums for a malpractice policy in Texas generally run about three to four thousand dollars per year for a chiropractor that's a pretty inexpensive amount as when you think about each malpractice claim probably costing in excess of a hundred thousand dollars to investigate and to pay an attorney and hire expert witnesses so there's very few malpractice lawsuits occurring and it's not something you should be overly concerned about the essential elements of a malpractice claim just like any negligence claim, involves four elements. The first element is duty. You don't have to provide care for everybody, but you do have to provide care for those patients you have accepted, and you have to provide care that meets the standards of care in the profession. And the second element is dereliction of duty, or negligence, or breach of duty. And, and this element means that the care provided was somehow substandard. The doctor failed to do something that a reasonable, prudent chiropractor should have done, or the chiropractor did it in a way inconsistent with what a reasonable, prudent chiropractor would have done. The third element is causation. The patient needs to demonstrate that the breach of duty or the negligence of the chiropractor caused damage to the patient, and that cause needs to be both a direct relationship and a foreseeable result of the negligence. And then lastly, the patient needs to demonstrate that they were damaged or injured by the malpractice. The patient, to prevail, has to prove all four of these elements. For a doctor to win a malpractice claim, they only have to defeat one of the elements, not all of them. But the patient needs to prove four of them. And as I mentioned earlier, these lawsuits are exceedingly rare, often because even when a chiropractor makes a mistake, the damage is usually such a small amount, it's simply not worth pursuing as a malpractice case. It's, there's not enough money involved for it to be worthwhile for the attorneys and the experts to become involved. So let's start talking first about the first element, duty. When is that duty established? When a doctor-patient relationship is created, that's when the, doctor patient, when the doctor owes a duty to provide care that meets the standard of care for the patient. So let's talk about a couple things here. Uh, first one is the doctor-patient relationship can be created either expressly or implicitly. A doctor-patient relationship is created expressly if the doctor states either in writing or orally, that they have accepted the patient and created a doctor-patient relationship. If you are careless with your new patient information, you may create a doctor-patient relationship before you've ever seen the patient. And that may be a mistake. That may limit your opportunity to turn down a patient. 
A doctor-patient relationship can also be created implicitly. When a doctor exercises their independent medical judgment for a patient, that creates a doctor-patient relationship. So that leads us to the next few comments. What about social settings or informal settings? What about giving someone a quick adjustment on a golf course or telling somebody at a cocktail party or at a bar that what their condition is or what it sounds like is a muscle strain and how they what they ought to do is put ice on it. Once the doctor starts giving advice, once the doctor starts describing the treatment or identifying the condition, the doctor has created a doctor-patient relationship. Now, if the doctor is only listening, if the doctor is listening to somebody describe their circumstances in a social setting, the correct response of the doctor is to say, you know what, this is not the right environment for me to be discussing or evaluating your condition, but call my office and make an appointment and we'll take good care of you. Uh, and we can discuss more detail what's going on. But be careful about how you handle those interactions so that you don't create a doctor-patient relationship by accident. Uh, same thing applies to telephone communications. Uh, if you're talking to somebody on the telephone, you can create a doctor-patient relationship as soon as you start to give advice. Here's something else to think about. If a patient or prospective patient calls your office and your staff answers the phone and your staff gives them a diagnosis or recommends treatment, that creates a doctor-patient relationship. You've never talked to the patient. You've never heard the patient's name. They've never been in your office. They've never paid you any money. But that can create, that's enough to create the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, same rules also apply to uh, communications by text or by email or communications over social media like Facebook or LinkedIn. And I want to emphasize that money is not the key. It is possible to create doctor-patient relationships even though the patient has never paid you any money and even though the patient has never been in your office and even though you don't have a file for that patient. The patient can simply testify that they met you at a bar, they discussed their condition with you, and you made recommendations on the treatment. Of course, if there's a lawsuit, your recommendations must have been wrong. Uh, Texas Supreme Court has held that because a physician has the right to reject employment, the reason a physician declines to treat a patient is immaterial to the issue of medical practice, medical malpractice. In other words, doctors always have the right to decide who their patients are. They do not have to accept every patient. And they can turn down a patient, even though the reason they turned down a patient was a bad decision. If they never created that doctor-patient relationship, the doctor has no liability. A physician may decline treatment and decline to create the physician-patient relationship, even if the information or the conclusion is incorrect, if the, if the doctor believes the condition is beyond their ability to treat. Now think about how useful that can be to in the chiropractic profession. If you've not created the doctor-patient relationship, you owe no duty to that patient and you don't cannot have any liability in this situation. A few quick thoughts about telephones. Uh, train your staff. Make sure you monitor your staff so that they're not giving professional advice or diagnoses or treatment plans over the telephone. You will have the staff person who hears you give advice repeatedly, and after they've heard you give the advice, they think they're qualified to decide when it's appropriate. Uh, make sure they understand that that's not their role to be giving that advice, not without your supervision, not without your recommendation. You also need to monitor yourself. Think about when you give advice over the telephone or internet. Uh, when you're dealing with new patients, somebody who's never been in your office, usually it's a mistake to give that advice over the telephone. The best practice is to listen to the patient and only listen to the patient and then offer to schedule an appointment 
to conduct a proper evaluation and decide what the best uh, treatment is and, and what's going on with that patient. Now, I also know that if you have existing patients and you have a pretty good idea what's going on and you're willing to take the risk of giving advice over the telephone or over the internet, you may certainly choose to do that, but understand that that's a risk uh, and you want to be careful about when you uh, take on that risk. It's also important to document telephone calls, whether it's a prospective patient or a new patient or an existing patient. You need to have practices and policies set up in your office so that you're creating a record of every phone call, every email, every text message, every fax, and that it's being reflected when appropriate in the proper patient's file. Uh, creating those kinds of logs can help you defeat claims. Sometimes a patient will remember that they called the chiropractor, but they may not remember the doctor's name or the name of the practice, and they may be confusing your name with somebody else's name. If you have an acceptable, a good, solid practice of keeping a record of phone calls and other communications, you're going to be able to defeat that claim by demonstrating that that person never called your office and being able to demonstrate it in a convincing manner. Uh, just saying you don't remember a phone call from a year and a half ago probably is not enough to be very convincing. So set these procedures in place in your office and make sure you follow them when appropriate. So remember, there's two ways to create a doctor-patient relationship and to start that duty that's required under the, the malpractice claim either expressly accepting the patient or implicitly accepting the patient by exercising your professional judgment on their behalf.